as an advanced type, which are their names, because as you know, they are Norwegian. Um, <laughs> Paul Greengrass, though, is not Norwegian, so that's an attractive. <laughs> Uh, Anders Danielson Lee, who played Brevik in the film. <laughs> Jonas Strand Grafi, Nilhar, again, Sedwick, who played Lara. And our director of the photography, our DP, Paul Ulmen Rosa. a lot of people might say this is a hard film to watch. What do you say, Paul, to those people who say this is a very difficult film experience? I'm not even sure if I want to go there. Well, it's a disturbing subject, for sure. For sure. But I think the world is quite disturbing right now, I would say. And um, although I think obviously the first as the 35 minutes are. I think ultimately as a film it's inspiring. I think it's the story of <clears throat> how Norway fought for her democracy against the, this terrible right-wing terrorist attack. And I think that that story speaks to all of us uh, across Europe and North America right now. I think we're facing some difficult times. Um. Anybody else, has anybody else maybe said to anybody in the cast or, or Paul and DP and they said, this is such a difficult subject matter, I don't know if I want to go sit through this, I just want to be entertained. What's your response to those people? We'll see, maybe I need to pick up the one. one. Uh, it's difficult yeah. for us to force upon people to see it, but uh, I, don't know. I have some friends that uh, said it's difficult, yes. But uh, I think it's important to see. Absolutely. Else? I was thinking that I think it's a good thing if you could use one of the most accessible, uh, popular mediums of all, the feature film format, to, to tell an important story. Um, uh, and because it's not, it shouldn't be all entertainment and, and popcorn. It should also be uh, a medium where you can. Uh, treat uh, difficult subject matter and um, stories that are uh, this, this in, the important stories of our time. Absolutely. Now you are um, all Norwegian with the exception of, of Paul. Do you remember where you were when this attack happened? And do you remember what your thoughts were when it happened? Yeah, of course, I think all Norwegians know exactly where they were and, and who they were with them. And their thoughts uh, that exact day. Um, I was uh, at a friend's house and I remember the total confusion that followed that day and that you had no idea um, if there were more attacks or if there was Al-Qaeda or who was behind this, this attack and um, it was a very confusing day for me. Anybody else have any um feelings about that day, and if so, did you use that feeling that you might have experienced on that day in your performance? You know, I mean, how, how crazy it is to have experienced learning about this happening in real time, and then years later be a part of a film. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I remember well um, where I was at the time, but I think that I wasn't, uh, I wasn't one of the, the ones that were affected like personally um, um, at these attacks, but um, I think as an actor, it's um, you have to have a whole different approach to a role like this uh, because um, uh, talking to Vili, the real Villier before we started shooting, and it was it's it's unbelievable. Uh, it's it's impossible for me to imagine how it actually felt to be on that island and to to experience these attacks. So it was. Um, even though I'm Norwegian and I, I knew this um, this story so well, and and 
I really felt uh, it had an impact on me when it happened. But to 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 do those scenes on the island and also doing the scenes in the aftermath of what happened, it's um, it was really hard. It was uh, and it was important for me to to talk a lot with Villier and 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 listen to his story uh, from him. Also, what's so um, terrifying about his story is that he continues to live it because he's living still with parts of the bullets, right? So, when you, did you speak to him about that and how is he able to just live in the moment? I was just thinking about that consistently as I watched the film. This is a person for whom he is not able to put it completely behind him because literally a part of that attack is inside of his physical body, and that must be just so terrifying to live with every day. Yeah, he, he said that it was it was terrifying, and and the fact that he knew that it could something could happen like every single second, he never knew if he was going to live or die in a long period of time after the attack. So I think it was yeah, it was terrifying, and also when he got uh, the message that the fragment had like capsule, so it it wasn't dangerous anymore. Yeah. That was maybe, even though that was a relief to know that he wasn't in danger anymore, it actually, it also were terrifying because that was the first time he realized that now I'm going to live like nothing yeah. happened, like everything is normal again. And that was also terrifying for him, I think. Absolutely. For Anders, you um, play the um, person in the movie that, um, it, for lack of a better word, the villain, so to speak, but he represents a lot of what's um, terrible in society today. How did you prepare for that performance? And was there anything, um, was there anything, you know, as an actor, you love what you do, was there anything that you could take from this experience that was joyful, or were you, you grew in some way as an actor, were you able to find any sort of joy um, in playing this character, or was it just, so difficult to uh, embody this pure force of evil. Well, joy is not the, <laughs> the right word, uh, but I think that um, to me it felt meaningful um, to to be a part of this film because I, I uh, when I read the script and when I talked to Paul, I I was very confident that he uh, wanted to make a film to remember. Uh, the victims, those who passed away and those who were injured, and that he was also curious to to ask questions, to try to find out why this happened, uh, that these people were not uh, killed by some mysterious force of evil, but that this was actually one of the most politically motivated terrorist attacks in recent memory, and um, whether we like it or not, he, he he, he, he was a lone wolf terrorist, but he, he, uh, there are many people out there in the world who share his ideas, and uh, far-right political extremism is on the rise, and we just have to, to confront those ideas. I, I think we, uh, uh, personally, I, I believe in freedom of speech, and uh, I think we have to, uh, to uh, use our best reason to, uh, to show that these are, ideas are false. Uh, so it felt like an important film to be a part of, and I was not thinking so much about my part of it or the role I was set to play. Uh, the only thing I knew was that uh, it felt like a huge responsibility to try to create a truthful portrait. And I didn't want to censor anything, I just wanted it to be as truthful as, po as possible. Can I talk about that a little bit? I remember very early on when I was, before I actually started writing, but I went to the art, well, first thing I did was ask the family's permission, and then they arranged me to go to the entire island. We obviously didn't shoot on the island itself, but the island that we shot on looks identical. But I actually went to the Torah Island itself, and um, I was told the most wonderful story, which in many ways um, 
uh, summed up why I wanted to make this film. Uh, the young man who runs the Toy Island now, you know, manages the facilities and so forth, explained that after it was all over, uh, the young people, about a year, year and a half later, after the trial was over, um, had to decide what to do with the toy. Which for decades and decades, so really since the Second World War, had been a place where young people in Norway had come to enjoy uh, fun and camp and, you know, uh, and all the rest of it, but also think about the world and think about civic leadership and so forth. And they voted, uh, had a big debate, and voted and decided that it was fundamental to them that the toy remained open, that if they closed it and it became simply a memorial to those who, who had died, that that is not what they would have wanted because it would be hand in brevic a victory. Mm -hmm. And so today, it still is a campsite. Young people still come all the time. Uh, it's a study centre too where young people come and discuss political extremism and perils and problems of it, particularly in our world, across the world. Uh, and the black building uh, that we depict there is now coated with 77 large columns which represent each of the people who died. And then outside it, uh, some four or five hundred smaller stays of each of which represents the survivor. And they call it the guarded house because the survivors guard those who are no longer with them. And he said, we want to, it's, we all felt that we had to enjoy life. And we talked about how it would be if I made the film. And I remember saying to you that we have to enjoy our work when we're making this film. Take it desperately seriously, but, but we would be handing a victory if we didn't enjoy our comradeship, enjoy the collective you know, beauty of making a film and then we intensely try and reflect on this subject, do our best work. You know, you're, you're known as a, uh, even when you're doing these features, you base a lot of it, um, of, the, of your work on real life events and there's a very, um, very much a documentary feel to the films that you make. Um, you also, on the other hand, do, you know, the born films, slightly different, but when you do these types of movies and, um, they feel so organic and so real and so natural, but at the same time, I'm imagining everything is directed so with a particular idea and aesthetic in mind. So how do you balance, or rather, how do you get extract from you know your actors and just in terms of directing? How do you make it so natural, but at the same time, have a vision that did you you know did you storyboard? a lot of these things beforehand, or did you just... Mm, I don't tend to do that myself. I mean, I plan meticulously, and I'll plan sequences meticulously, and so, you, know, you have to know what you're trying to do. Um, but, you know, films, films do many things, I and mean, I love making entertaining films. Yeah. I love making more movies. I love a car chase, as you might have noticed. Um, <laughs> I, I love a big fight, you know. I, I love all those things. I love, there's nothing better than I like in, in life than going to the movies on a Saturday night yeah. with a bottle of popcorn, you know. Um, but it's nice, not nice, I feel that I need to for myself as a filmmaker from time to time think about the way the world is. Uh, I've got young adult children and I think we're in a very troubling moment politically with this huge uh, shift, unprecedented shift towards extremist uh, politics at the moment. And so you try and, I make films so that's what I try and do. In terms of the rest of it, you trust in your actors and you trust in, and I was very blessed in this film to work with all Norwegian actors, none of whom I knew, I didn't know any of their work, but you know, um, and also a, a Norwegian crew, and you know, a lot of it 
a match with Miss Downton, that gentleman on the end there, Paul, who we'd never met each other. He seemed frighteningly young to me. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and we just clicked for the first moment because he knew how to photograph this film. You know. Yeah, I was about the photography. It's so beautiful because it's um, just, you know, tonally you've got those, you know, those dim grays and muted blues. When you came to the film, did you have um, an aesthetic idea of how you wanted to see the film photographed? Did you collaborate along the way? What was that collaboration process like? Well, it's um, a huge collaboration, you know, you know, with Paul and uh, and also with all the other departments. But uh, uh, I think the approach on the film was uh, it, from the start very truthfully in a way. We have to kind of uh, recreate some of the scenes that we know from uh, TV and you know we've seen happening in the real world. So it's it's important to be you know truthful to <coughs> how to reconstruct them. But um, no, we uh, you know natural and truthful way to tell stories is, you know, you have to, uh, if you in, in some some of the situation put yourself into a, a real situation, what how will we tell the story if you can only shoot it once, you know? Um, let the actors be open in the room, uh, they walk wherever they want to go, follow them instead of setting limitation on where to put them, you know? Yeah, let them go in and out of lights, it's, it's a, it's difficult, but at the same time also uh, uh, in great, uh, I, I can't find the word, but uh, deliberating to, 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 to follow the actors, you know. A lot of the time you're studying how light actually falls, really. And that's the key, isn't it, Paul? You know, to look at how, now if you look at this room here, light. It's available, you know, it's lit, it's available light for this space, and it's it's falling in certain places. You know. yeah, it's it's still there, and there's some still here, and then there's a little few pieces there, and then there's a different light there. And often, what you, you know, what you're looking for is to allow what is there to, to dare, and it takes courage, I think, as a cinematographer, to really observe how the light is falling and let that be your guide. And it does, it's not the same, I'm not saying by that you just shoot it, that's not what I'm saying. You, but you work with the warp and weave of the light that's there. I was going to ask about when, um, during what seasons you film the movie, because obviously there's snow and then there's like summer represented. Um, as we know in Norway, there's periods where there's lots of light and there's periods where there's no light. Did you have to manipulate that at all? Like, were there any scenes that you were filming in the middle of the night to make it look like it was early evening, or did you, you know, did you have to? Well, the, again, you know, available light means that, you know, we have to use available light, but of course, if you shoot an interior scene and you know that you will uh, go over a certain amount of hours because you cannot do it in one or two, which is the light, then you have to start to recreate kind of, you know, natural light, which sometimes is uh, easy and sometimes is difficult. and. Uh, but it's also a, a plan, you know, when we did with uh, Chris Carreras, you know, he's the first AD, you know, we plan stuff, so we, the stuff you see out the windows, we shoot first, and then we can always turn around and do it if we don't. So. But we try to do the whole scene in one, so... so, uh, so it's the truth is, when you shoot, you lose the time, and there's about 20 minutes of life. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys see the island scene. So, generally, uh, generally, Paul, it's very different, I'd say... If you shoot this side, can you light the light? <laughs> right. Can you look like daylight? And yeah. you go slightly white. <laughs> the book, One of Us, um, how much of it, on which, the, I mean, the film is, is based on the book, it's also based on real life events, but how much of an influence was that particular book and the making of this film? Very much. It's the CSF book, One of Us, is the best book about the subject. It's a very meticulous, long, and rather beautiful book, and it, it's comprehensive. It's the story of, uh, it's really the story actually of, uh, of Anders Breivik from birth and the two uh, friends of Lydia Simon and Anders who, who, who died. It's really their 
story of how they they grew up and collided then on through the trial and up the other side. Um, uh, and she's a you know a very considerable figure in Norway, and it's a, a brilliant book. And we had lots of discussions. I I just felt that for me the film and you know any film you have to choose the story that you want to tell, and no film can tell the story of everything. You know. I just felt that the story that I wanted to tell was the story of what happened afterwards. Of course, you know, the first half hour or so has to portray what happened because you have to do a little bit of, to a certain extent, you know, in the film, live through that to get to what the film's about, which is how Norway fought for her democracy, how one family, these two young people, came through the experience and what effect it had on their hopes and dreams and ideas and and, uh, and that in the end make for me centering the story on Vilja who's in the book but he's a much less important character than Simon Anders uh, because I wanted to create this you know uh, structure where you have I think what is the choice for young people today increasingly you know there's no doubt that many young people across your country, across the UK, where I live, across Europe, are increasingly angry, I think, and feel excluded, feel the system doesn't work for them, uh, you know, that uh, are troubled by the changing world, and the, of course all their fears and anxieties and angers are amplified and echoed by social media, and I think it's part of the... Uh, and, and they're starting to think of solutions that are beyond the democratic norms, as I've always understood in my life. And I think that there is a, a, a struggle coming in amongst young people about what sort of world they want to live in. And that struggle, I think, is exemplified by Vinya Hensel on the one hand and Anders Berg on the other. For um, Sarah and Jonas, this was your first film for both of you. And you both carried the film in so many ways. Um, without you, this film would not have resonated in the way that it did. I, I believe that. And you have those amazing courtroom scenes where you had to essentially recite monologues. Were those difficult? And um, how did you prepare for, for that scene particularly? Um, yeah, of course, they were very difficult to do. Um, I spoke to Laura a lot before doing the scene, and it's um, it's quite close to what she actually said that day, and it's um, it's a representation of her her strength to walk in to that room and to to face the man who killed her sister, and and she has been most amazing girl to to talk to and to to discuss things with and and it's also in the film because she um, not long after the attacks she went to the hospital to to see the other victims and to check on them and that has been so inspiring to um, speak to her about that and and so the courtroom scene I know was very important for for her journey and for her to get some sort of closure, um, and also to to speak not only for her and her family but also for many uh, refugees who come to the country to seek security and for some reason doesn't get it. So um, it was. Uh, it was a tough scene to do, but it was it's not possible to, to imagine what it was like because we did that scene in the exact room that, that it happened. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it was so inspiring to talk to her, and I felt really honored to get to portray her in this film. Do you remember how many takes you did of that scene, Paul? <laughs> Is it several takes? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a few. Um, but, um, I mean, they were both fantastic the way they, they nailed it. It's, it's a funny thing. Uh, 
relationship, you know, director, filmmaker, actor, director, actor. It's a certain point, and it, it's sure, I think, of big, big scenes. Of course, you can prepare together, you know, you prepare and you think about what you're doing and you know, try and get mentally prepared and think through, you know, how it might go. But in the end, the single thing that you can do on my side is just believe. In the believe in their ability to do it. And that's the best thing you can do. You know, in the end, it's a little like sports, you know, when they when an actor walks across that white line, only they can do that special thing that only actors can do to sit in a space being photographed and literally create an alternative reality with sufficient intensity and conviction that, you know, months, months later, thousands of miles away, you're watching at some level believe that's a that's a beautiful artistry. It's a, that's performance art of art of a beautiful time. And and only the actor can do it. And the, and, the, and it, you, what you have to do is believe in them in your heart and soul. That's what that's the thing I think that they can find. I can't speak we have a couple more thing. we have a couple more minutes. Quickly, that scene for you, how was it? And then I have one last question then. Uh, no, I, I think it was, uh, it was of course, really hard to do, uh, both because I knew that it was an important scene for the film, but also because I felt like that was that was the most important scene for me to do good, because I wanted to show how brave uh, the real Willier was, um, to, to, uh, to actually go into that room and sit down face to face with the guy who, who tried to kill him and, and shot him five times, uh, and so... So it was important to really show his focus uh, in when it came to his journey in the recovery. Um, um, and yeah, as Seda said, it was shot in the actual room, so it was a lot of emotions just because of that. And um, yeah, but it was, I think, one of the best things uh, when we were doing this film was that Paul gave us so much time. Uh, in every single scene and every single situation, so we didn't have to rush anything. And and when you get a lot of time to to just be in a situation, something you 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 feel more free and you don't feel like you have to rush anything and yeah, get to some specific point. So that was that was really good. Just one last quick question: The film is going to be on Netflix in October tenth, right? Is that yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So basically, it's um, the model. The, the model of this film premiering is such that people all over the world are going to be able to access it um, at the same time um, in Norway, in the States. What do you hope that people get out of this film that are watching it? What do you hope the messages that they come away with, um, or what kind of inspiration, etc., do you hope that they get gleaned from watching this movie? I guess anyone can answer that. Uh, well, my hope is that people can see this film as a local story with a global message, uh, that they can see it as a cautionary tale about uh, the worst possible consequences of uh, political extremism. And, um, and speaking for my part as well, I think um, we need to know more about the power and danger of, of radicalization, whether it's uh, political, ideological, or religious radicalization. So I hope it's a film that uh, that can be, I, I know it's disturbing to watch it, but I hope it can be uh, meaningful uh, for uh, a lot of people in many countries, and that uh, ultimately it's a film for uh, that's, that was made to honor the victims, so the point is not too long. Thank you all so much for such a beautiful film.